Thank you, Megan, and to everyone on Megan's team for having the courage to have an in-person event. Oh my gosh, here we all are. What an awesome moment. I'm gonna to start today by talking with you about moments, actually. Our lives are shaped by them. There are moments that change us and shape who we are. We've all had them. Circumstances, events, situations. Some so joyful, some sad, some even scary. Some are big, some are small. They're usually very notable, often electric. You can remember the sounds, the sights, the smells of a moment when they happen. One of my big moments was having twins, yes, twins, 17 years ago. And though I am actually leaving this event to go on college visits with them this week, I can so vividly remember that day. I can remember the sounds in the room, the smell of their blankets as they were put in my arms. It felt like the world had stopped. We also have small moments. I remember my first day of college, which I won't share with you exactly how many years ago that was. But I remember what I wore, where I sat, who was in the room. My first trip to London, I stood on a street corner and I could smell the scent of curry. I could hear seven languages around me and I could feel the wind as cars whizzed by. I felt like I was in the center of the world. This very moment right now, it feels like it will be a very notable memory. I don't know about all of you, but this is the first business trip I've been on, the first industry event, the first stage. I will even be so transparent today, it's the first time I've worn shoes, have combed the back of my hair, because normally I only need to comb the front for the Zoom, Zoom part, but it's, all, but it's just a great moment. And, it's, um, and I know I will be remembered, I hope you all remember it as well as that we're coming back. And, um, and this is a real moment we're having. And being with all of you, yes. <laughs> being with all of you, talking about the state of games and our undeniably exciting future that we have. It's also, in addition to being a pretty big moment for me, this is a full circle moment. 26 years ago, almost to the day, and I'm not kidding, almost to the day, here in Las Vegas, I had my first day of work at Westwood Studios. Now Westwood is the famed studio known for the Command and Conquer series, and it really was the first day of the rest of my life. At the time, I was working in architecture firms, and a friend told me about a local PC gaming company who was hiring. But first, let me set the scene for you. This was 1996, okay? Among other culture-defining moments, such as the Macarena taking the world by storm, <laughs> listening to music on your disc man, and lest we not forget the Spice Girls. Now, as important as they were, something else massive was happening in the world. The internet was exploding. In 1994, I think there were about less than 3,000 websites in the world. By 1996, there were 300,000. When we, and when we think today about big tech, this looked radically different than it does today. First, Microsoft was focused on Windows 95, and we were a good five years before the first Xbox. Apple was focused on the new Power Macintosh, and we were 11 years from the iPhone launch. Amazon had only sold its first book the year before, and Netflix, Google, and Facebook didn't even exist. And yet, it felt like the world was having a moment. Something big was going on. And I didn't know anything at the time about Westwood, but I wanted to learn more. So I got into my VW Cabriolet, drove over to the community college so I could rent a dial-up terminal to go on their website. Now, I see many of you in this room, you may not know what a dial-up terminal is, we can get into that in another talk. But there, when I was on the, term on the terminal, I learned that Westwood had created such games as Eye of the Beholder, Lands of Lore, Dune 2, but they had also released a version of Monopoly for Hasbro. And this version of Monopoly could be played, wait for it, over the internet. And now I realized that this age of gaming was defined by Doom, Avalon, the original Warcraft, but for me, playing Monopoly around the world is what resonated. I have played games my entire life. 
board games, card games, arcade games, the Atari. I even played text-based adventure games in my PC high school lab. My motivation has always been very high to organize games with other people. I would go to great lengths to schedule and organize friends to have family game nights. I organized lunchtime card games at the architecture firms. And of course, what holiday would be complete without a little family competition? Now, having that shared social experience to me was incredibly fun. It was about coming together and having that shared moment. So the idea that anyone could go online at any time and play games with others, I just knew it was going to change the world. And I guess you could call it one of my defining moments. And thanks to my deep enthusiasm for online gaming, they, um, one of my responsibilities at Westwood was to run Westwood Online. And at the time, we had a million players. And I thought this was massive. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is 80 times the size of my hometown in Tahoe. Like, it just blew my mind. Like, there could be a million people together. But yet, our industry was so young and pretty immature. Gaming was in its infancy. Many of us were in our 20s. And we were focused on making games and having fun. We really had no idea of the impact that we were going to have on entertainment, technology, and society. Now, I look around this room, and I do see friends, so many friends that I've known for so long. And it feels like we've grown up together. From once being the little sibling of Hollywood or Silicon Valley to now, today, we are modern entertainment. And it sits at the intersection of technology, interactivity, social, and media. We have matured. Our industry has grown. And we now represent the very future of the consumption of media, content, and sport. We have collectively created platforms, social networks, and dare I say, mini metaverses, by which society will interact, engage, play, create, compete, and interact. We're going to talk today about the moment the world is having, and particularly the moment that gaming is having. So let's talk about the metaverse. We can't possibly have a DICE keynote in 2022 without talking about the moment that the metaverse is having. And who isn't talking about the metaverse? So many companies, so many people trying to figure out what the metaverse means for them. Now here in Las Vegas, just a month ago, the CES trade show was going on. And the metaverse was front and center. And here was one of my favorite headlines. Metaverses metaversed the metaverse. What? But if you push past the headlines, what we're really talking about is this. Our existing internet's next spatial and experiential evolution will be more tangible, interactive, and actualized. It will be an ecosystem where people will engage, create, play, compete, and transact together. Online worlds with their own culture, rules, economy, and language. So wait, does this sound familiar? Because it should. Okay, we're going to go to 1997. I was still living here in Las Vegas. I was still working at Westwood. And the world was continually to rapidly change. This time, it was being driven by the launch of a game called Ultima Online. And it was the very beginning of MMOs. Now, my story is not that different from what Phil Spencer shared about four years ago on this very stage at DICE. But there is one difference, which I'll get to. So keep in mind, this is the old school days of game development. We spent all of our time at the office. We were young. We had bad dial-up connections at home. And so we'd work during the day and play games at night. I was really lucky that I sat near a group of very generous game designers who were nice enough to allow me the ropes, show me the ropes and teach me how to play the game. We would venture out. We would earn really good gear and in inventory, purely thanks to their mad skills, not mine. <laughs> there was no global chat, no maps. You earned your reputation in Britannia. There were heroes, there were villains, and everything in between. So one Saturday, I was out doing errands, and my apartment was really close to the office. And so I drove by, and I felt this unbelievable tug to go play UO by myself. So yes, let's cut to the chase. I thought I was going out with a nice group of players. I got taken out to the woods. I got killed. I got robbed. 
everything gone. Now, the same thing happened to Phil, but this is where our stories take a bit of a departure. Phil said, oh, I was looking at my corpse and my inventory was you know, getting stolen. It was, just, it was magic, it was magic when that happened because Phil's more enlightened than I am. He said, this pure magic, that something could happen like this in a virtual world. Well, I have to tell you, I was livid. I was furious, I was so mad, the idea of calling the real police actually crossed my mind. That's how unreasonable I was. I had been robbed, and it was so unfair, so unfair. So on Monday, I had to go back in the office and face my designer friends and explain what happened to all my stuff, because I had nothing. Of course, they laughed their asses off and um, wanted me to stick with them, and they took me out to go get replaced with my stolen inventory. UO was the Wild West. It just seemed like pure chaos. One player went so far as to assassinate the creator himself, Lord British, during an in-game speech. It was just fascinating to see what happens when people that don't have social constructs or rule sets. It is just anarchy. But through future launches of MMOs, of course, rules came into place, the industry developed and adopted more common standards and rule sets for how players play. Today, the biggest games and most popular games have come a long way since the days of getting mugged in UO. They allow for various elements of socializing, creating, sharing, viewing, cooperating, competing, all with contained rule sets. But now, we're entering a new Wild West. There are so many companies, brands, and people jumping into this deep, murky pool we are calling the metaverse. Major big box retailers like Walmart want us to shop in the metaverse. Car companies like Hyundai want to introduce us to meta mobility. Even companies like Dyson, yes, the people who make vacuum cleaners and fancy hair dryers, they're getting in on the action with the metaverse. And I can tell you with a high degree of certainty that my hopes and dreams for the metaverse do not include me cleaning my virtual house. <laughs> Similar to the early days of MMOs, it feels like chaos. But order will come, the rule sets of society will apply, and I ask you this, we all started this metaverse party decades ago. How do we plan on guiding it into the future? The gaming industry, all of us, are best positioned of anyone to bring common protocols, open platforms, connectivity, and cooperation to this very moment. We need some world order, and no industry can do that like ours. So while we are reclaiming things that started with gaming, let's talk social networks. We started the idea of a social network and now we need to reimagine it. So remember that community of one million players in Westwood Online I mentioned before? It was a highly engaged, connected and passionate community. Friendships were forged, relationships were strengthened, competition was had. We all build the world's greatest entertainment, amazing content and experiences. They bring people together around worlds and characters that they love with people who they want to spend time with. And it is our greatest differentiator and advantage we have compared to other entertainment mediums. So like many of you, I played World of Warcraft for several years, no different than most people in gaming. At the peak of my engagement, I was in a family guild with my husband, my sister-in-law, brother-in-law, my nephews, and my niece. So remember those twins I mentioned earlier? They were still under two. My husband and I were tired. We never left our house, and we needed something fun to do together. And yes, I can attest, families who game together stay together. I'm living proof. But we were living in San Francisco at the time, and our family was in Southern California. We'd only see each other about once a year, but we played Warcraft a lot. We would adventure through Azeroth, going on quests, instances, raids, craft things for each other, help each other. They helped me a lot as I got lost. We'd have epic wins, epic losses. It was unbelievably bonding and so much fun. We were truly connected. I knew it was going on in their lives and it was going on in ours. And so this was 15 years ago. Today, this entire family live in the Bay Area close to us. In fact, my sister-in-law lives six blocks away from us. And I kid you not, hand on heart can tell you that we, were, we spent far more time together and were, more close, and were closer and more connected when we were playing World of Warcraft than we even are today. There's two takeaways from this. In today's divisive world, games can be an incredibly effective way of connecting people 
even breaking geographic location boundaries. They can be living next door to each other, playing games connects you. And the other piece that I think is really important we're gonna talk about is smaller groups, smaller groups and smaller friend groups have incredible holding power for players to continue to engage and keep coming back to the games they love. There are billions of people playing games today, yes. And yes, companies like mine, we often talk about the hundreds of millions of people, of players in our network. But what's most meaningful, most meaningful to players are the small, familiar groups that they connect with every day. One example in FIFA, we've realized that people who play with four to eight, this is sliver of a number, four to eight friends, when they play with four to eight friends, they will play up to four times more than those who don't play with friends at all. This is unbelievably powerful. And it's not about massive, massive networks, it's about an atomic network. Incredible. Two years ago, February 2020, Tim Sweeney stood on this very stage at DICE and talked about the trend of gaming as a social activity. He also said that we can do a lot of good by working together to set the organizing and social protocols needed. Yes, he is so right. And he said all of this without knowing that in a matter of days, we were all headed for a global shutdown, which completely accelerated the need for virtual social connection. Games are one of the most meaningful ways you can connect. Power of play. During the pandemic, even the World Health Organization recommended that people play games to stay socially connected, and particularly in the interest of mental well-being. I have to tell you, in all my years in this industry, I never thought I would see the World Health Organization make this kind of statement. And as we go forward, social ecosystems won't just be in and around our games, they will be the very foundation of them. So the importance of creating the safest, most positive communities possible should be at the top priority that we all share. The massive social networks that have defined the digital ecosystem for the past 15 years are stumbling. They're under great pressure from regulators, parents, and the media. And it's not because people don't see their value. It's because people don't think they've done enough to keep us safe. Now, it's easy to say that the toxicity that we see in our communities, in our online communities, is merely a reflection of the world that's going on around us. We shrug our shoulders and say, the problem is just too big to solve. But that is not us. That is not the gaming industry. We are fighters. We are clever. We are resilient. And we can dare to do better. The ingenuity of game developers, designers, artists, engineers, can have a significant impact on creating safer communities for players. One example at Respawn, the Apex team had heard from players about being attacked or targeted over voice and chat communication, particularly female players. So they created a ping system as a means of communication amongst players that doesn't require the use of voice or text. The designers wanted to help create a more inclusive and accessible experience. The system was clever, innovative, and really well received by players, and I think the industry at large. And it was so unique that it earned and qualified it for a patent. So but about six months ago, we at EA created a patent pledge where we committed that every developer in the industry will be able to use our accessibly centered patents completely royalty free. The pledge covers some of our, thank you. This pledge covers some of our most innovative technologies designed to make games more inclusive, including the Apex ping system for anyone to use freely. We are, we are, we are better together. And we must set and uphold standards, collaborate where we can, because the implications are significant. I'm gonna share another story with you as well. We can enlist players on this. While some people will always push the boundaries, the people that killed and robbed me and the, people, the person that assassinated Lord British as an example, um, we've seen that when players receive feedback about their behavior, many of them actually change it. So for example, 85% of Apex Legends players who received an email from us 
after they were exhibiting behavior that violated our positive play charter, they didn't do it again. We didn't have to ban them. We didn't have to punish them. We just needed to send them a little love note and remind them about the rules within the game, and they complied. I still believe in the goodness of people. So here we are, sitting in a uniquely powerful position at the intersection of technology, entertainment, and social activity. We're poised to reclaim some of the today's biggest opportunities. And all of you this week are gonna have a great time talking about interesting subjects like NFTs and crypto and blockchain and metaverses. But we also have to connect to the humanity of what we do and how we are doing it. Let's face it, there have been some rough headlines this past year about companies in our industry. Stories about negligence and lawsuits, all stemming from leaders who didn't uphold the values and principles that the majority of us have come to expect. These stories we've all read run very deep. Women have been harassed bullied, marginalized, held back in their careers, paid less, and much, much worse. These are real stories, real human beings, and this is going on at companies in our industry. Now, of all the success, growth, position of strength that gaming has in the world, if companies can't figure this out and fix this burning issue, we don't get to move forward and we will not pass go. We must protect, defend, and fight for everyone in our industry. We have to have fair and safe work environments. At the very least, I mean, this is just, this is just basic table stakes. We've seen leaders at the highest level fall short of setting the right standards. And the issue is exasperated and multiplied when these leaders seem to benefit from the destructive behavior. And I don't care, I don't, I, I just, I don't care how successful a business is, leaders who fall short of this must go. A far higher standard of expectations and measures that come from everywhere, investors, boards of directors, leadership teams, and it can come from all of us across the industry. Now, the stories I referenced about women have been in the Wall Street Journal over the past year, but make no mistake, we need a safe place for people of all races, gender, sexual orientation, and abilities. The teams making games must represent the world in which we are serving. Now there are big, thank you, there are big declarations. There are some really big declarations being made about diversity and equity commitments. And you know what, this is, this is really great, it is. I love, I love this. If they can be achieved, this is more like the culture we want to have and who we want to be. But let's take it a step further. Let's create some real accountability. Whether it's through our existing industry organizations or we create something new, we need to publicly track and communicate the progress of these commitments. Many of us have worked together for a long time. And guess what? We're not making games from our garage anymore. We have a tremendous amount of power and responsibility in this world. We must hold each other accountable. It matters. It matters a lot. People become game developers because they love making and playing games. But if we want to continue to attract the most creative and talented people, we have to make our industry a great place to work for everyone. And when we acknowledge the diversity of the human experience, we put ourselves in a better position to create content and experiences that represent the world that we live in, the games we create, the people who create them, shape societies and cultures all over the world. What we put out there, how people talk to each other, how people see other people, happens through the lens and filters of the content we create. Attention must be paid on all fronts of diversity and inclusion. At EA, um, a little over five years ago, we created, started creating some pretty aggressive programs around diversity and inclusion. 
Um, we immediately stated a zero tolerance policy. We created employee resource groups. We created mechanisms for people to report um, harassment and behavioral issues in the company. And one really meaningful, interesting program that came from this effort was our inclusion framework. The inclusion framework was something that we added to our creative process and development. It wasn't meant to add complexity. It's not meant to be, have mandates for our developers. It was meant to help them be very intentional about the diversity and inclusion in the content that they create. Being aware of key areas, asking key questions, using the right filters for the content. How often do we seek to tell stories of underrepresented people? Are we portraying people of diverse backgrounds authentically? Are we imparting any unconscious bias into our narrative? And how diverse and inclusive are our stories, our gameplay modes, our settings? This isn't an exercise in checking a box. We all have the distinct privilege to create content that really do shape how people see the world and how they show up for each other. So Netflix has a series that I really love. It's called The Playbook. I don't know if any of you have seen it. It has five episodes in it. And each episode follows a coach. And these coaches share their rules for success in sport and life. My favorite one was of Doc Rivers. He's the coach of the Boston Celtics and LA Clippers fame. And he shared the meaning of the African philosophical concept called Ubuntu. It is the culture and expectation that he sets for all of his teams. And it's primarily prevalent in Africa, in South Africa and Zimbabwe. And it translates to, I am because we are. It's the idea that we learn how to be human from other humans. Think about that for a minute. We learn how to be human from each other. A person is a person through other people. I can't be all I can be unless you are all you can be. I can never be threatened by you because you are good, because the better you are, the better I am. Nelson Mandela said, it is a profound sense that we are human only through the humanity of others. That if we are to accomplish anything in this world, it will be in equal measure due to the work and achievements of others. The moment that gaming is having right now will be determined by how we show up, by how we learn from each other, and how we can be better together. Now, I've offered many ideas today about how to do that. I have lots more, by the way. But they can't be done in isolation or silos. Building a better generation of social networks, defining the future of the metaverse, bringing some order, holding each other accountable for creating a better culture in our industry, impacting societies and cultures around the world for the better. It is all of this, it is all within our reach. But to get there, we have to be intentional and make every moment matter. So I ask all of you amazingly talented and supremely gifted game developers and industry leaders, what is your legacy? What moment do you want to be remembered for? Thank you. <laughs>